Uh, we are planning to have a Good Friday service on Friday, March the 29th. That's coming up in about two weeks or so. Uh, so, plan for that. We'll meet here at the church by 7 o'clock and we'll have an evening of uh, hymns that focus on the sufferings and death of our Savior. Uh, we'll have scripture readings that uh, remind us of, uh, of that and, uh, and then I'll have a brief message as well. So, uh, please plan for that for Friday evening, March the 29th at 7 p.m. Uh, perhaps let others in the community know about that and uh, they can join us as well. Our Sunday school will continue downstairs, uh, and we'll continue our study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, let's hear our call to worship this morning from Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Let's begin our service this morning with our opening hymn. And Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce it. All right, you're all in trouble because I brought one of my hymn books. Because I couldn't bear to let this hymn go without giving some information about it. So, uh, there's a group of people uh, persecuted in surrounding areas of Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, who, uh, by a man, thanks to a man by the name of uh, Zinzendorf, Nicholas von Zinzendorf, uh, allowed them to come and take refuge at one of his estates. The uh, house there is by the name of Herrenhut. Pardon my German. And uh, so the, the group of people came there. He taught them. They, they would work for him. And he actually was very influential in teaching them to sing in every task. Singing in work, singing in play, singing in school, everything. So uh, hymns became uh, infused with their culture. We know them by the, uh, the term the Moravians, what they grew to be. We've heard of Moravian tile works, we've heard of Moravian College or Bethlehem. Uh, so there is a lot of influence just in our area alone. I would encourage you to go back and research Moravians in general and the kind of influence they've had just on America in general. But uh, their, their hymnological influence is profound. And uh, there's a group of them who also influenced a, another, uh, there's a couple of young men that they influenced. And as a result, these men really came to a true understanding of God and became believers. Those men were uh, John and Charles Wesley. You've probably heard of them if you've done any kind of hymn research. Uh, and Charles Wesley would typically write a hymn on his birthday every year, and then after he came to, an, to a true knowledge of Christ, he would write a hymn for his spiritual birthday every year. And this hymn, uh, which originally, just look up, the title was uh, Glory to God and Praise and Love, uh, and then, let's see, somewhere around here, it was also used, I should have highlighted it, oh well, anyway, songs for his spiritual birthday. Um, originally, it had 12 stanzas, we don't sing all 12, we sing 7 through 12 of those stanzas. If you want to see the first few stanzas, they're in the book, you can look at them at the church. Um, and most uh, hymn compilers, they, wouldn't, they would actually not include the first stanzas because they were a little too personal for congregational use. Not that there was anything the matter with them. They're really beautiful hymns, and it's an incredible expression of Charles and his spiritual understanding. I would encourage you to read through those, but they just figured 
for a congregational sense, we really should just sing this 7 through 12, the last stanzas. Um, and uh, so that's why we, we just sing those. And I'm trying to think if there was anything else I want to point out quickly. Um, so. I guess that's, that's all I'll say for today. But we'll, we'll start this morning singing with Charles Wesley's hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's pay, praise, number 133, and we'll stand to sing. Our scripture readings this morning will begin 
with the Gospel of John, chapter 8. And I'll read for you beginning with the 46th verse. You'll find that in your pew Bible on page 1060. John, chapter 8, beginning with verse 46. Jesus said, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say... If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God, but you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say that I did not know Him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The next reading this morning comes from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning with the 11th verse in our pew Bible, that's on page 1189. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer Sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Let's respond to the reading of God's word by praying as the Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. of his love for us, 
His broken body and His shed blood. So the communion meal is an opportunity for us to have fellowship with our living Lord. The elements are uh, given to us to be a sign and seal of that which has been given to us in the grace of the gospel. They point to His death, sufferings, or heart behalf. When we offer the communion, of course, we do not uh, transform the elements and make them into the literal, physical body and blood of Christ. Uh, Christ's body is resurrected. His body is in heaven. It is a human, finite body. Though glorified, it is nonetheless a finite body. It is in the heavenly places and is not somehow transmigrated into this, these communion elements. And so that is nothing but a superstition that would transform these elements into the literal body and blood of Christ. We receive them as signs and seals of His death on our behalf. They are given to us at His appointment, they show forth His death, and they, and, and they call upon us to communicate or to take part in the meal in a worthy fashion. That is to say, not that we have become perfect or that we are uh, sinless in this life, but rather we come to the communion meal as those who are daily, regularly repenting of our sins and resting in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Our communion is in His death and not in our own good works or in other uh, uh, forms of faith. We rest in Christ and His provision of grace there. It gives us spiritual nourishment and growth in grace. As our minds are directed to what God has provided us in Christ, our hearts are strengthened by faith. We are equipped now to love and serve God. In the communion meal, we fellowship with Christ. His Spirit meets with us, and we are strengthened in our faith. Know that He died for me. Faith is an individual thing. Uh, it, it, it embraces Christ personally. And in this communion meal, as we take part in these elements, just as we feed ourselves with these elements, we are joined to Christ. And we testify to our union with Him in this communion meal. Uh, it also reminds us of our obligations to serve the Lord. And so as we take part in the communion meal, we obligate ourselves to walk in communion with Christ. He is our covenant Lord. And so those who take part in the communion who are joined to Christ should serve the Lord. We have an individual relationship with Christ, but we also have a corporate relationship with Christ's body, the church. And so as we take part in the meal, we indicate that we are uh, at peace with each other, that we are in fellowship with Christ's church, that we are walking with the Lord as members of this one mystical body. The body of Christ is mystical in the sense that the church is not merely confined here in this congregation or within perhaps even the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but it extends through every nation uh, and, and, and every age. It includes all those who by faith rest in Christ and in Him alone. And so our communion is with the body of Christ, fellowship with uh, the saints Christ. All right, next hymn number 531, Come My Soul, Thy Suit Prepares. 531, and we'll stand this evening.
3. I'd like to read to you from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. I think we'll just uh, confine our reading to that text for this morning. Colossians 2, verses, excuse me, Colossians 4, beginning with the second verse. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the Word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we pray for the illumining of your spirit, that you would open our hearts to receive the things that your word has to say. May your spirit work them into our hearts and lives, that we are transformed by them, that these things not merely tickle our ears and uh, uh, attract our intellect for a moment, but rather that they would work themselves out in our lives, that we would become people of faith, people who pray, people who walk with wisdom in the world today. We ask your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. After two days of deliberation, the white smoke began to drift up above the uh, Basilica in Rome, noting that the deliberations were concluded, that the Roman Catholic Church had decided upon a new pope. He would take on the name of Francis, uh, indicating his own appreciation for St. Francis of Assisi, uh, saint of the past who was known for his great humility, a Jesuit. They say that they had to go to the ends of the earth for this particular pope. He came from Argentina. Let me see if I can get his name. Jorge Mario Bergoglio, something like that. Anyway, very friendly uh, uh, gentleman, a uh, humble man who rode the bus along with the rest of the cardinals and paid his hotel bills and walks around with normal black shoes and a black a watch with a black wristband. So I'm following the Pope. Black shoes and black wristband. <laughs> One of the first uh, things that he did was to go to the Basilica of St. Mary uh, to pray uh, for God's blessing on the church at Rome. And with that he began his uh, pontificate, if I can pronounce that correctly. It certainly is a great way to start your earthly ministry, uh, to appeal to God in heaven for his assistance by the help of his spirit. Unfortunately, he prayed to the Virgin Mary, so his prayers were, I think, misdirected. In any case, the Apostle Paul advises the church to be a church of prayer, to have prayer uh, fill your life and govern the way you approach life. Prayer is not really something to be engaged in in those moments of quietude, uh, those moments when you have retreated from the rest of the world and begin to focus on more heavenly things, but prayer is something that should be outward directed. It should be focused on the, the challenges of each day that uh, present themselves to us. Prayer needs to have this outward focus. And in looking at the world around us, looking at God's calling in our lives in this world, this prayer should be, as I'll describe it, gospel-centered. It should have a focus on the advance of the gospel in our lives and the lives of those around us and throughout the earth. And I think this is something of what we see in Paul's exhortation to the church at Colossae. An exhortation to prayer, to steadfastness in prayer, uh, for the sake of God's kingdom requirements for the advance of the gospel in all the earth. And so we want to uh, 
direct our attention to the idea of prayer once more this morning, but perhaps take a little bit of a different look at it than perhaps what we ordinarily would do. And the first thing that I would note about this exhortation to prayer that Paul gives to us is that it is given once more in the greater context of this exhortation to the church to set their minds on heavenly things and by uh, focusing on Christ and His resurrection and the new life that we have in Him to begin to put to death their old ways and old habits and put into practice the work of Christ. Well, how are you doing with that? How are you doing at implementing the Word of Christ and uh, putting on Christ, clothing yourself with Christ and His compassion and His love and grace with each day? No doubt you've experienced, as I have, many failures, many times which we fall far short of that to which God has called us to. And you might wonder, how may I actually bring this about in my life? How can I make this effective for myself? How is it that I, as a husband, can love my wife the way I ought to, self-sacrificially? How is it can I, that I, as a wife, can submit to my husband and respect his decisions in the home? When there are perhaps many times when that's a very challenging thing to do. How do we live as parents, children in our homes, as masters and servants in our homes, in our community? How do we put into effect God's great kingdom demands on us. We recognize the truth of what God has had to say. We should act in this way. But so often we fall far short of that. You might be tempted to think to yourself that, well, what we've been taught so far is simply the idea that we need to change the way we think. And if we simply do that, then everything will improve. And yes, there's a certain measure to that, but I'm reminded of a, a situation comedy that I watched this week. My parents and I got to watch it with uh, Bob Newhart. He's sitting in a psychologist's office and he has a client come in to meet him there. And the woman sits down and he asks her what her problem is. And she says, well, I, I have this great fear of being buried alive in a box probably seen this skit before. And so Bob says to her, the, the psychologist says to her, well, that's a very terrible thing to be thinking about, being buried in the box. It's horrible. And she says, I know, it just disturbs me to no end. And then she says, what do I have to do? And says, okay, I've got the solution for you. It's just two words. And she, says, she gets out a pen and paper and she, he says, no, you don't need to write it down. Most people can remember the two words. So she's ready for it, right? What's the solution? He says, stop it! <laughs> stop it! That's stupid thinking! Stop it! And the whole skit goes on like this where she brings up all different kinds of problems and the solution is just stop it! Well, finally she gets to the point where she's frustrated and she says back then, you stop it! And it would seem that psychology and counseling is really very simple. You just stop the bad behaviors and put on the new behaviors, right? It's just as simple as that. Just stop it. Well, it's not always quite that simple, is it? And perhaps this is why the Apostle Paul directs us to devote ourselves to prayer, to pray steadfastly. Because we need help. We need strength, divine strength, to overcome these sins in our life and to put on the habits of righteousness and compassion and love. We don't have the ability in and of ourselves, relying upon ourselves, to just simply stop it or to just simply do something else. We need God's help for that. And so Paul uh, brings all this discussion on how we ought to change our lives to this focus point that we need to pray. Pray steadfastly that God will make these changes in our lives. Pray. 
Prayer is a wonderful schoolhouse that the, God, that the Lord provides for us. It's a place where we learn a couple of important truths. One, God teaches us humility. Prayer drives us to our knees, literally, because we recognize that we need help. Being on your knees is the position of one who's begging, right? It's one who is earnest and, and, and sincere about what he needs. So we learn humility in the school of prayer. Prayer teaches us that we are, ha, cannot rely on our own self or on our own resources. We must look above for God's help. Here's where our prayer, or excuse me, our pride is constantly beaten down. And this is in part why prayer is so difficult. In part why we pray so infrequently. Because we have too much pride. We depend too much upon ourselves. We trust that I can get through the day. I don't need to pray. I don't need to be praying about uh, all the different activities of my day. I'm fine with it. I just go ahead and go about my day. It happens, right? It's a certain species of arrogance when we begin to think that way. I'm self-sufficient. I have all the resources that I need to face the challenges of the day. Paul says, pray. pray prayer teaches us humility before the Lord. It also teaches us faith. Faith to trust that God loves us and that God will provide for that which we need. This act of prayer is not a, a foolish thing where we just go through these motions and the prayers don't go above the ceiling. They're actually heard in heaven. The omniscient God who hears and understands all that's in our hearts and knows us through and through understands what we need even before we ask. Prayer teaches us to trust in God and not in ourselves. To rest in Him and His provision. And to place all things at His disposal. I was reading a, a portion of a chapter from a Bishop Spong, John Shelby Spong, an Episcopalian uh, basically an atheist is what he is, but he, he's a, a, a man who holds to, uh, professes Christianity, a non-theistic form of Christianity, where God is the ground of being inside of us, and there's no objective God out there, triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, personal, and so forth, to whom we pray, who acts in history and time to uh, do His will, no, God is the ground and source of life. He is the ground of being. And so prayer is not a communication with a divine God, but prayer is really kind of a meditation, a contemplation of looking within and finding God within and finding our resources within to face all of our problems in the world. So prayer becomes self-focused. And we become divine. His prayer is to oneself, really. Paul justly warned of those on whom the wrath is revealed from heaven, who no longer worship God, but worship uh, for, for the creatures, men and beasts. They worship themselves. And that's where he is going. Prayer directs our attention to the true God and waits upon Him to answer. Now, we can go into a, a good deal of discussion about the answers to prayer and what we are to look for. And Spahn wonders why there are things that don't get answered, even though people pray eagerly, earnestly for certain things. Sometimes God does not answer those prayers. You have somebody who is contracting a severe illness, maybe at the point or brink of death even, and you pray steadfastly for the recovery and nothing happens. They pass. Was your prayer in vain, worthless? No. If you understand prayer, you're seeking God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you bring all things under His Lordship. And it's His will that is uh, sought in the end. 
but he calls upon us to pray for the advance of his kingdom. And that's where Paul directs us uh, in the verse of, in, in, in the challenges that follow. There's so much here to say. <laughs> um, one of the things Paul says here is that when you pray, you pray with watchfulness. You watch. That's the idea of being on guard. Remember Jesus with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. He called them to watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There are all kinds of challenges before us, spiritual challenges. And we need to pray so that we are prepared for these challenges. We are prepared for spiritual warfare. Uh, the new pope took on the name of Francis, but he began his ministry in prayer. Perhaps he should have considered the name of Gregory as one who is a warrior in prayer, who's always on watch, on guard for the people of God. The Greek word from which this watch comes from it is the word from which we get the name Gregory. We should be Gregory's in our spiritual life, praying, always on guard, watching for the advance of the evil in our homes, our families, our personal life, our country. There's so much to be praying for in that regard. And we need to be attuned to the advance of evil and pray against that evil. Pray for the advance of God's kingdom. To that end, Paul says, pray for me. Pray for me as an apostle. I'm not some super spiritual man who doesn't need prayer. I need covet your prayers. You'll find in his letters multiple occasions when he asked the congregations to pray for him. Pray because he needs to preach the word of God, the mysteries of Christ, with boldness before an evil world. Now, first of all, it's rather challenging as a minister of the gospel, and I can testify to this. That you need to explain the mysteries of the kingdom of God in an earthly way, such that people can understand, perceive, grasp, and implement in their lives these great spiritual truths. Now, Paul describes them as mysteries because they are dependent upon God's revelation. They're not open merely to reason and speculation or uh, some sort of religious feeling. Rather, they are revealed from God. And the minister who proclaims a message needs to proclaim the revelation of God to the world around him. That's what gives the minister his authority. He does not preach that which he feels is right and good, or that which he thinks is wise and just, he should proclaim the word of God. And when a minister founds his ministry upon the word of God, then he can speak with great power and authority. He can say, thus says the Lord. Not just merely, I think this is what you should do. Or maybe you ought to consider making this improvement in your life. No, thus says the Lord. Divine authority. That should radiate through the ministry of the Word. It's grounded in God's revelation. So Paul prays that in the preaching of this mystery of Christ that he would have uh, the ability to make it manifest, make it clear, as he ought to. Uh, perhaps Paul is very much conscious as I am of my own inabilities in the use of the English language. For me, speaking is hard. It's a challenge. It might not seem that way sometimes from Sunday to Sunday, but I stumble over my words. And to try to explain concepts is not easy. Paul asked that he be helped to make the Word of God plain and clear. That is so important to Christian preaching. There should be a point to your message. People should know what you have to say. Understand them where you're at. Be able to grasp that one point and walk away with it and say, yes, the preacher told me to do this. You should pray. Take that home with you. Pray. That's the one point. Okay, work it out in your life. But the minister of the word should be clear in what he has to say. 
and explaining the message of the scriptures. And so Paul asked for the prayers of God's people that he'd be able to make that word clear. And he prays for an open door, an opportunity to preach the word. Now remember, he is in prison at this time in Rome. He has a certain measure of, of, I think, house freedom there, but he's not free to travel like he used to be able to do. He's not able to go and plant new churches anywhere. He's locked up in Rome. He's limited as to who he can see or what he can say. And so he asked for a door for the ministry of the Word. It must have been intensely frustrating to him to be locked up, to be incarcerated, and to feel that there's nothing I can do to preach Christ. There's so many places that I need to go. And yet, the Word of God is not bound, is it? Never is it bound. John Bunyan in the prison, wasting away for years there, writes Pilgrim's Progress. One of the great, uh, uh, kind of like a parable, of the kingdom of God, salvation. God uses even moments of imprisonment in our lives to accomplish His purpose. Paul, in prison, writes his prison epistles. And his ministry in prison perhaps had greater impact than the planting of churches in different locations because we have the Word of God revealed to us through man who is a prisoner. What forms of imprisonment do you face? Maybe you're not locked up in a jail, but sometimes you feel like you're confined in what you would like to be able to do. Body doesn't work the way it used to be able to do. You don't have the, the finances to do what you'd like to do. You, you, you're, you've got certain responsibilities that keep you at home. You're not able to do everything you want to do. Well, God has put you there. Make use of what God has given to you so that the Word of God might, might advance. So Paul prays for an opportunity to, to proclaim the gospel. And so much of us understand what that means when we're sitting with other folks or talking with people in the community and you would like nothing more to talk to them about their spiritual state. And so often the conversation drifts on all kinds of things. And, and, and I'm always there with the sports and the politics and all the rest of it. But the real important thing is how is your soul? What is your relationship with God? Are you secure for eternity? Or are you on the path that leads to destruction? Paul sought for an open door, and we need the same opportunities when we can talk to folks and explain to them the gospel of Christ. So Paul prayed or ask the congregation to pray for him in this regard. And it's clear that he has then a kingdom focus. The advance of God's kingdom throughout the world. He does not pray for his release from prison so much, or an end to the pain and the problems of being in shackles and so forth. He prays for the advance of God's word in the world today. And we need to have that kind of focus in our prayer life. Focusing on the advance of the kingdom. Do you wish to see this ministry prosper? Do you wish to see others filling our church pews? Do you wish to see multiple services here? You want to put me really to work? <laughs> Pray! Pray for me. Pray for the advance of the kingdom. Pray for the advance of God's word on, online. Pray that the gospel will be proclaimed. And then Paul, and just very quickly I'll close with this, exhorts the congregation to walk with wisdom in the world around you. If God opens up that door, provides you with the opportunity, be wise, redeem the time, buy it up, take advantage of that which God gives you. Speak with husbands and wives, children and parents, speak with uh, friends and neighbors, talk to them about Christ. Walk with wisdom around them. Know that they are watching. Paul is concerned about those who are outside or without the church. 
There is a demarcation. There is a boundary line. There are two kingdoms in the world today. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Some are inside that kingdom and others are outside looking in. Alexander McLaren has a powerful sermon on the, this part of the message where he focuses on those who are without and those who are within. Within is the kingdom of God and of light where life and love flows evermore. Outside, there's death, fear, corruption, destruction. Are you without or within? Are you in the kingdom of God or outside looking in? Don't let your life pass looking from the outside. Come to Christ and rest on Him, His provision of salvation. So we need to take advantage of the time that we have. Use it for the sake of the gospel. Have your speech seasoned with salt. Be sharp. Be alert. Uh, be precise in your explanation of the gospel. And apply it to each individual as, as they need it. Some people need a different response. But each one needs the gospel. Be wise in the way that you address them. Well, I'm, I'm going real quickly through here because our time is up. We need to be people of prayer. Gregor's. Maybe we all need to take on that name. My name is R. Scott Gregory McLaren. <laughs> we need to be people of prayer and understand that we are engaged in a war. And prayer is one of the great armaments for that great warfare. Remember Paul's wonderful words at the conclusion of Ephesians chapter 6 where he talks to the Christian and says, Take on the whole armor of God, because our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and spirits of heavenly places who are at work in the world today. We need to be prepared. And so he begins to talk about the great armor of God. Probably he's looking at a Roman soldier standing next to him and sees him standing there with his helmet and his shield and his breastplate and his sword. And he says, the Christian is much like that, putting on all these spiritual uh, qualities and values, righteousness, faith, and understanding of the gospel, and so forth. And how does he conclude all that? He says, pray, pray, pray. Pray for me. The way in which we advance the kingdom is not in resting on ourselves, our good morals, our understanding of truth, our uh, activity in the world today, we need to pray because the battle belongs to the Lord. It's His battle and we need His help. Apart from that, we'll not be able to work out those values in our lives, of love for wife and husband, children and so forth transforming our lives under Christ. We cannot do that without God's help. Therefore, pray. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for the ministry of Paul and for his exhortation to us, reminding us that our warfare is spiritual and not merely material. We pray that your blessing would be on us, that we would focus more and more on the importance of prayer, and with each day, spend time with you in prayer. And as we approach different activities in the course of the day, may we pray. And as we think of others who are near to us and dear to us, may we pray for them. May we pray for our country and our church. May we pray for Christ's glory to be manifest in all things. For we pray in His name. Amen. Let's respond this morning to ministry of the gospel by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and hands.
stand and sing praise to our God for all his many blessings to us. Sing his praise. Keep them from evil. We pray that you would help us to be 
strong and secure in Christ, rooted in your word, walking in accord with your word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing will be on each family, that husbands and wives, parents and children will walk uh, in Christ, uh, focusing their minds on Christ. We pray for our body as a church as we serve you in this community. We pray that our minds would be set on Christ and that his kingdom would be foremost in our hearts. We pray that you would bless us as we advance that kingdom in our work, in our social relationships, in our uh, civic engagements, in our cultural uh, participation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant us the help of your spirit, that in every way we would show forth Christ and his glory. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would transform our community, that uh, people would abandon faith in self, that they will come into your kingdom and enjoy the light and beauty of your great heavenly city. Bless our families, provide for our needs, be with those who are apart from us today, watch over and provide for them. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each one. We pray that you would watch over those who are elderly and strengthen their health, and protect our children. Bless us, O Lord, as we walk before you. Bless our church, that it would be a glory and a praise to your name. We pray that you would watch over our uh, country, keep it from sin, overcome the evil that is within us, grant us repentance for our many sins, and help us to walk with you. Lord, we pray for others who name the name of Christ. We pray that they would know the grace of repentance and faith, that they would turn from sin, sins against Christ, against his word, against your work in the world. We pray that we would all trust in you and focus our minds on Christ. We ask for the advancing of your kingdom in Christ's name. Amen. Our final hymn, number 127, Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder, number 127, and we'll stand to sing.
peace to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Thank you.